Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, so I think you actually went beyond this, this division between the good part and the evil part, the nuances uh, uh, very clearly. But most of our analysis come from what has happened in the past. And the world is changing, and the world is changing very, very fast. So what we have had in the last three years, four years, has been a pandemic like no other since the 1920s, the first global pandemic, truly global pandemic for a century. Uh, we have had, we coming from a period of very deep economic crisis, at least in many of the developed parts of the world. And then, of course, there's the war of aggression of uh, Russia in Ukraine that is shifting everything. There's now a geopolitical risk that is affecting the flows of FDI and the flows of trade. So how do you think this is going to lead to significant changes in the location of economic activity? And is it going to reinforce centers? Is it going to benefit the fat cats? Or is it going to lead to a new system that is more efficient and perhaps also fairer, or perhaps more efficient, less fair or fairer, but less efficient? So who wants to start? Uh, well, I, I can okay, yeah. just simple roll in the ball and then maybe uh, I'm, I, I don't really believe in deglobalization. There is a, a lot of debate recently in academia in particular, but also on the media on this deglobalization. A lot of um, attention has been also. Uh, devoted to reshoring, which is in reality an old phenomenon that uh, has remained marginal anyway, according to data, is that this occasionally uh, the, the modalities of globalization change. Um, um, there are, yeah, the, the conflict in Europe is a conflict in Europe, so is very, very important because it's in Europe, but there are conflicts all over the world that influences. So, I mean, in, in my view, the fat cats are there, are becoming fatter and fatter, to the point also that uh, uh, governments have not seen taxes from this coming in, and that is a huge drawback to redistribution, to equality, to fairness. And so beyond the shape that trade can, can trade and FDI and internationalization modalities because, you know, mergers and acquisition are possibly, I mean, surely much more important than, you know, greenfield stuff. There is the need of regulating more the economy. Uh, this has been, the trend has been since the early 80s in the world, deregulation. I'm not going into the regulation of finance because uh, nobody, you know, is, is reminding us that what we had in 2008, that was probably the most devastating crisis that is not comparable even with COVID because we were still in recession in 2020 when COVID came because of the 2007-2008 crash. I mean, and it was caused by financial innovation. It was really caused. And now it's interesting to see what is going on in San Francisco and California with the, the, the bank failure. Bank failure. So, I mean, all this needs thinking on regulation, that is unfortunately not only national but supranational because to regulate a Google is not an American story, it's a global story and how to cope with that. I mean, I, I can see the general picture but I have no knowledge to, you know, translate that into empirical, <laughs> you know, empirical. Well. 
you have already touched into my second and third questions, which were Sorry. about... No, no, it's perfect. <laughs> which were about uh, nearshoring, reshoring, friendshoring, okay. and then the question of regulation and taxation. But who wants to chip in into the first well, part? I, you know, I think if I may show. say yes, uh, I agree with Simona. I mean, the globalization has a lot of inertia, and it is unclear how much of these changes will be structural and how much will revert, or they're temporary. Sort of some diversification supply chains we see when we talk to people, and there's some people that sort of feel this, and they feel these changes in demand for their products. So we do see them. I mentioned the case of uh, APIs, so I have the pharmaceutical ingredients, where it's clear. We see it in other cases, like, I don't know, label printing, uh, people that need different digital equipment to do shorter runs because the type of customer they have is changing. But it is unclear how much will that will remain after a time. So I think the, the key point here is that certain industries and certain sectors, people and the decision makers have realized that they had a very large dependence on foreign supply chains and that this might not always be strategically the best way to go about it. So, and that is obviously generating a significant change and in, in the case of renewables where I'm more knowledgeable, it is generating significant changes in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, and Europe is trying to follow that, albeit with measures that are maybe not as protectionist. But, but it clearly will have an impact in certain sectors, I think. Others, it, I think it's open to see. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue of uh, reshoring and uh, French shoring and near shoring, the pandemic has put in evidence, in a very clear evidence, how uh, many economies across the world were unprepared to have to deal in, with a world that, if it's not deglobalizing, was partially deglobalizing, rapidly deglobalizing at a certain point in time, and then things came back. But the question is, uh, now it's a ge real geopolitical risk. So I'm going to direct that question to you, Frank, uh, first. Uh, do you think that French shoring and reshoring for geopolitical reasons, just to avoid the dependence on China, for example, for certain manufacturing products. Is feasible, is possible, or we are too far too integrated for that we have reached, perhaps as Simona was highlighting a moment ago, a point of no, no return? Right, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, of course, the million dollar question. Um, I, to some extent, I think it's, uh, we aren't as globalized as we sometimes think. So, um, I, I, in 2018, the World Bank invited me to work on a, on a report on the value chains of Ukraine. Uh, and the idea was, well, you know, with all this stuff going on around Crimea, uh, probably the, the original attachment of Ukraine to, to Russia was not long-term feasible. Uh, so, in the longer run, they would have to connect to... Uh, to Western, uh, Western European value chains. Um, and when I started looking at the data, I was surprised by how local those value chains are. Not, not any value chain. So, so you know, the, the supermarkets, they invest everywhere. But the car manufacturers in Germany, they invest in Poland. But not just in Poland, just right across the border in Poland. So when you looked at Ukraine's um, invest, uh, uh, who invested in Ukraine and where, you saw even within the Ukraine that the, uh, the Germans and Austrians and, and some other of the, of the core uh, manufacturing part of Europe, they invested in the western part of Ukraine. And in 2008, you could already see that Ukraine was actually the, the center of, the economic center of gravity of Ukraine was moving slowly to the west. So it was first it moved eastward and then westward. Because if you think of what Ukraine had to do, they, they had to disconnect themselves from a production system. Um, and that other countries have tried to do that before. Uh, so, so the Soviet production system was a very dis different one from the one that was organized around Germany, Northern Italy, and so on. Um, and in the 1990s, countries like Poland and, uh, and Romania and Hungary and Czech Republic, they needed to reorient themselves away from Russia and towards uh, Western value chains. Um, countries like Poland and the Czech Republic, Hungary, they had two advantages compared to Ukraine. And that, and that relates a little bit to your question about how, how far away are we sourcing from. The one, uh, the one advantage was that part of the Soviet system moved with them. Right? They were all part of the Soviet bloc. So 
of that Soviet production system. So they didn't lose all of their trade links. And they started slowly, you, should you could see that countries like Romania and Poland and so on, they started to trade more with each other and with Germany and less with, uh, with, uh, with Russia. Ukraine doesn't have that advantage because that's gone. Right? So uh, it, it, the, the Soviet system is gone. All of its collaborators, uh, all of its production collaborators are in the east, especially for the heavy manufacturing. The other thing, and that's to your point, is that the distance uh, from Ukraine to Germany is very large. And it turns out that the distance decay of especially like these value chain uh, investments in, in cars and so on, it's, it's pretty steep. So steep that you see the west of Poland has investments, the east doesn't. The west of Hungary has investments, the east. It's, it's all bunched up along the border. So in that sense, what COVID may have changed is we all got on Zoom, but I'm not sure uh, how that impacts uh, the distance decay in, in, uh, in the value chain. So we were never as, in parts of it, we were buying from all over the world, but other parts were actually pretty tightly geographically linked. Uh, so I think that's to some extent uh, uh, making me wonder how, uh, what, what is the, a more nuanced view of, of how globalized we actually were. Since you brought the global value chains and uh, the geographical boundedness, and Ricardo, you've been working quite a lot on global value chains. Being part of the global value chains is fundamental for innovation. You highlighted in your presentation, Frank, that it's probably the most efficient way of generating innovation and therefore growth, but it's not that easy. Uh, you've been working on the policy of how can this be achieved. What are the mechanisms through which uh, can our firms, our companies, uh, be engaged into these value chains? And what are the obstacles that they have to face? What are the main obstacles? Well, uh, absolutely, with what you, what was mentioned before in terms of the changing like geopolitical landscape uh, with COVID-19 and then with the aggression of Ukraine, it's made apparent that dealing with like the internationalization of the economy and dealing with global value chain has like very specific challenges vis-a-vis -vis the past. Why? Because we have come to the realization that the world is facing a completely new phase of high uncertainty and a completely like reshaping of the distribution of risk. So we are dealing with not only with the continued pandemic risk, uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, geopolitical tensions, we are dealing with extreme weather events that also change, no? or if you think about Fukushima, for example, so there are the, the uncertainty and the, 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 the presence of these events that are extremely disruptive uh, for uh, global value and supply chains has become the new normal. And therefore, both businesses and uh, governments need to deal with this new reality and understand how to position themselves in global value chains and what type of tools can build a, a new type of resilience, a resilience that allows you to link up to value chains, link value chains to the local economy while dealing with uh, a world that is constantly changing. Um, so in terms of the tools, having uh, 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 instruments that are flexible, at the, in terms of public policies that are adaptable, that can allow the, the policy paradigm, the support, the, the diffusion of uh, information for firms to make their decisions that can change quickly, that can adapt quickly, is particularly important. Um, think about the example of the Resilience and Recovery Plan and the current debate on how should we rethink about this tool. Is it delivering? Is it not? And what changes might be needed? You know, this was designed during the pandemic with the idea, okay, that's a huge injection of resources that can allow the European economy to adapt and respond uh, to the challenge of the pandemic. But now we are wondering how to what extent can governments really absorb the resources, use these resources in a, in a, in a productive manner. So even for that tool that uh, clearly removed the for, for many countries, the, the, the budget constraint is making a lot of resources available. There is the big question on how to make these resources work in a flexible manner, given how quickly the landscape is changing and how quickly the challenging link with the digital and the green transition are uh, becoming more and more apparent and diversified for countries, for, so for different member states, but also for different type of regions and cities within those member states. Mm -hmm. Um, last question for me before I open it to the audience. Just remember to start thinking about your questions, and you, of course you can ask your questions either in English or in Spanish. But um, you mentioned, especially with the platform economies, um, they have contributed significantly to improve our quality of life, they have increased productivity, they have made uh, the 
availability of certain products cheaper in many ways. Uh, many people in rural areas would say that Amazon has been the main contributor for life satisfaction uh, there. But of course, there's a problem that uh, they're far away. They cut the middleman. They link directly uh, activities that are originated in the Silicon Valley or in San Francisco to things that are happening here in Valencia or anywhere in Spain. And it becomes very difficult to actually get any benefits in terms of influence on the local economy or in terms of taxation. Mm -hmm. So my question to all of you is, how do we go about this whole process of greater mobility of technology, greater mobility of capital in a more integrated world? Do we need to regulate more or better or in a different way? Do we need to tax more? And we have been waiting for the OECD and the European Commission to come with taxations that never materialize. Or, I mean, they will materialize eventually, but it's taken longer than expected. Or do we do nothing? So who wants to... Well, I'll kick off because yeah. uh, you, you are talking about the benefits of Amazon. Now, I mean, I, I have to be convinced on an empirical basis that... The, it is thanks to Amazon or to Google that we have technology. Mm -hmm. It's not said anywhere, and uh, um, the, the most of the patents of these firms are actually coming from acquisition of small firms, sometimes with one or two, you know, young engineers. If you walk for up to through San Francisco nowadays, you hear, just hear, around you, 30, 35 years old, young physicists, computer scientists that have set up a firm with a friend, so footloose, really, and they are there with the hope of being acquired. And so this is not innovation. Moreover, as I said and showed, I mean, Google uses Android. Android is based on open source Linux, okay? As BSD Unix is all open source. So this doesn't mean that this giant creates innovation. They find a very good way to exploit innovation. We would have it anyway. What... Uh, uh, Airbnb does could be absolutely done by cooperative of firms that then reinvest the profit, while in this way, 30% goes to a, an Airbnb firm that doesn't employ anyone. These are not the old Ford or General Motors or, you know, the big, that employed a lot of people and therefore distributed the profits. These are firms that share their profits with a very small pot of young talent that earn salaries that are unconceivable. In fact, you saw San Francisco's people are under tents because one flat in San Francisco City nowadays is almost reaching billions of dollars, which is, yeah? This is what it, it happens. So, in my opinion, is just a matter of changing mentality, not allowing monopolies of, and we are talking about big tech and not by, about farmers and, and regulating somehow, and as it was before the wave of the regulation started, neoliberalism came. I mean, the policy of the US government is had been influenced by these giants. I mean, Bayer or, 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 or you know, uh, 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 Pfizer or... So, in a way, rethinking is not that we owe them innovation. At the same time, also regulation goes ahead with taxation, uh, w w with the rethinking of, uh, of the financial systems. It's not only for equity in Europe. In Europe, you are, you're right, and I, I agree with Frank, is, is, is global value chains are very local across Europe, is also to enforce a sort of equity with the rest of the world, with, with, the, with an African continent that 
is treated by the World Bank as if it was a huge container with no <laughs> heterogeneity within, which, you know, is, is something outrageous nowadays. So it's, it's probably the dream of, a, of an idealistic person, but this is what is coming also for our new generations. Are you in agreement with uh, Simona Frank? Well, well, maybe to, to add to this, uh, it, it's very interesting to compare Bell Labs, which was the big technology giant of the 20s to 50s. Mm. Well, it exists to the 80s, but basically Hades with that. And, uh, and the Google Plex and those kind of things. Uh, and there, there are very marked differences. So Bell Labs was a monopoly because it was, it was a phone monopoly. So if you had the infrastructure, you were the monopolist. And the government knew that. So they were constantly at risk of losing, uh, of being uh, torn apart, apart as a company. Uh, and what they they went, in, they had a deal um, that they would license for almost no money all of the technology that they invented. So the the uh, how hands-on the government was in those days is very different from Google because Google also has a. I mean, they they, they probably do cool stuff. Uh, right, so the, the, the researchers there are really good. That uh, my, the, the physicists that I work, my, my, my center is mostly physicists. They, they, they do say there's, there's quite some, some cool technology coming out. Um, but the reason why they have a monopoly is because there are huge economies of scale to having data, for instance. Mm. So they own the data so they can run the models and that's why they can actually predict much better than others. Um, and, and the question is, um, if you, how do you, deal with that monopoly. Bell Labs uh, invented satellites, they, uh, they invented the, the, uh, the transistor, they, they, they invented basically a whole lot of things that you think, why would they do that? Well, the reason was the only way they could make more money is to become more productive. Mm -hmm. So then they could lower the costs or let people give people a slightly better service. So, so they, they, they had an incentive to invent things that made their mm -hmm. services better. The Silicon Valley based, like also venture capital based uh, system is, is based on profitability. So why do you invest in Uber? Um, why do you throw hundreds of millions of dollars in, into Uber? Because it then grows faster than Lyft, and then it has the entire market, and because of the network externalities, yeah. that's actually why Uber became valuable, not because it had a better product. So in the Silicon Valley kind of venture capital run uh, system, uh, being, f being first to scale is very important. But that is not necessarily giving you the same incentives to improve the technology as like the, the, the Bell Labs system did. There are actually some people that say that when uh, the, the, the big research labs like Bell Labs uh, um, uh, started losing ground, uh, the US lab, uh, labor productivity growth started declining. So they, they, they think that the, the shift in how we innovate from this sort of internally mission-oriented uh, research of, of a Bell Labs kind of institute versus where we are now, uh, that that creates very different dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just, just put the other side, I think, from, from sort of the bank or... <coughs> when we interact with, you know, VCs, venture capital firms, um, well, obviously you bring to them an idea, it's not big tech, admittedly, but it's, it's the whole host of small startups and small companies that have a new product, they have an idea, and these people will try to identify, obviously, the winners, but in many cases, they will make a mistake. It's, it's obvious, if you invest so early in a firm, you will make many mistakes. So the point is, okay, you, you will get one winner out of 20 or whatever, and that will winner will have to pay for the rest. But it's, it's worth bearing in mind also that they have funded another 19, which has had an idea, which was difficult to anticipate whether it was really going to work or not, and that has been pushed through, and that's helped uh, entrepreneurs, and it helped innovation. I really don't know whether that's better or not, the, the other yeah. model, but the, that is something that is useful. Well, maybe because it's yeah. difficult yeah, for yeah, these yeah, people yeah. otherwise to get off the ground. Um, you know, th there are not that many other ways of, of getting them to have s seed money, unless, it, um, unless they have it personally, or to you know, uh, use these sort of networks. So maybe ju just to, to nuance my, my somewhat uh, <laughs> too broad brush there. I, I agree, like the, 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 the small scale venture capital uh, uh, that was important in the 70s, 80s, where you put one million, two millions into a company and uh, give it the possibility to actually go to market. That is super useful. The hundreds of millions of dollars that you put into companies to just scale faster than their competitors, it's not clear whether that is beneficial for society. 
So, Carlo? Yeah, I, I think we need to be like, very careful in terms of balancing uh, uh, different views uh, 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 when it comes to such a, like a crucial area of science and technology policy as well as like, taxation and regulation. I, I was thinking about like, the example that Simona mentioned before about the con recombinant RNA vaccines and Moderna. And like, it, it, so that's true that there is an issue of like, how do we make sure that the profits that are generated by huge uh, uh, R&D investments are there uh, and are like, fairly like, redistributed in a certain sense and that the diffusion of innovation is not blocked uh, by the need of, of large companies to uh, extract uh, revenues from, from those investments. At the same time, like, it's, it's a complex balancing act because we need to make sure that we don't, for example, in this case, uh, 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 hamper the recombinant RNA revolution that is going well beyond the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, has very important implications, for example, in terms of the next generation of vaccines that we might need, but also in terms of uh, curing cancer, et cetera. So that's a big, like, new area of, of, of applied uh, research uh, that, of course, needs to have the right motives and the right incentives for firms to make investments. So we need to, to make sure that we don't go into like a, a sort of like punitive framework for, for firms that are indeed making investments because we do also do need the scaling up capabilities of these large firms without like having these large companies like supporting the scaling up of the production of vaccines. Maybe we would not be here having this conversation face to face. So we also need it, like the logistics, the, the, the capability to ramp up uh, production, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the failure uh, or, or, or the uh, like a smaller success success of the AstraZeneca vaccine is an example of like, what happens uh, once you don't find the right partner, so the science doesn't find the right company uh, for, for, for this type of uh, process to, to happen. So I think we need to be, to be very careful because also this approach goes hand in hand with uh, the mission-oriented science and technology policies that are also like, very dangerous because are telling basic countries, are telling firms, are telling regions in many cases, like in which areas of science and technologies they should be investing on rather than like having a more like blue sky approach and saying, okay, let's create the condition, a little bit what the U DARPA did in the US, let's explore the frontier of science and let's allow like the economies and firms really to see and the market to decide where like technology should evolve into. So I think uh, it's, it is a, it's a very like delicate balancing act that needs like sound evidence and need a very uh, balanced approach. Uh, to understanding the, 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 the right type of incentives and the consequences of, of, of certain decisions. If I may, I, I totally agree with Ricardo, and it is very, very important to clarify that what we were saying, we were talking, is big giants, giants, okay, that really harm competition and redistribution of resources at the... I just want to, 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 to think about one example that, you know, Cuba has a very effective vaccine that was developed in 2020 due to its big sector, university research in that area. The whole 14 million have been vaccinated from two years to 80 immediately. But the American embargo didn't allow Cuba to sell the product to anyone in Central Latin America and elsewhere in the world. So, and this is behind that, there are the big pharma, obviously, beyond, beyond the embargo. So, I mean, capabilities and, and non-mission policies are, in my opinion, it's, I, I am completely aligned, but these giants actually translate themselves in national government policies. And the second thing that we have to be very, very careful about is that the Google, the, 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 the Facebook, the control data at the personal level. Nobody else does. If we do not intervene with AI, the market, the demand is done by them. So it's not only the supply problem. Well, I, th I think there are quite a lot of uh, different views, but let's go to the audience and who wants to start asking questions. There's someone, yes, if, uh, please, uh, there's someone with a microphone. So if you can uh, bring the microphone over here. Can you, puede decir su nombre y... I'm Professor Bernardo from the University of Valencia. 
given the fact that there are so many people uh, here very related to the LSC, uh, I think that we all have missed uh, any uh, comment uh, with respect uh, to the Brexit. Uh, all the topics you have talked about are very, very relevant. So what all of you have to say about Brexit, please. <laughs> <laughs> Brexit in the context of an even distribution of finance, foreign direct oh. investment, and uh, multinationals. I'm out. <laughs> You're out. <laughs> I'll leave that to you guys. <laughs> so who wants to go? Uh, I can say something. I mean, don't, don't get us started. Um, <laughs> 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 exactly. So, well, I, I, I think Brexit is, I mean, if it wasn't like the place where I live and where my kids are growing, like, would be a very interesting example of the very, very adverse consequences of a country like deliberately disconnected, disconnecting from the type of like chains and process of integration that we have been discussing. So of, of a country that was yeah, hugely benefiting uh, uh, from uh, global investment flows, participation in, in the very high like value added segments of, of global value chains. And then because of like a, a, a political decision and in some cases an ideological decision, uh, uh, deciding to disconnect uh, from, from this system. But not only that, while I think we should respect the decision, the, 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 the vote of the people, uh, on the other hand, there is the issue of how like, Brexit could be uh, implemented. And, and the way in which like, the, the, the Brexit process had unfolded itself has been the most damaging possible for the people of the United Kingdom. And that's, that's, that's the big hurting part of this, of this story. So I, I think at the moment what we are like living in the UK is, 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 is a clear example of how the disconnection from this type of chains can be uh, damaging uh, on the one end and can be damaging in particular for the places that <coughs> need the most this type of integration. So for the, the, the poorest places and the less developed places in the country are ones suffering the most uh, that are also the ones that voted more like to support, uh, for support Brexit. But I think, uh, if, if I may, the UK is also like an example of uh, the potential side effect of an unbalanced integration into global value chains because a lot of the inequalities that we have seen, in particular special inequalities that we have seen in uh, uh, the UK are also part, uh, and Andres has done uh, amazing work on this topic, part of the reason why the UK has not seen uh, uh, a, a European membership as an opportunity, but rather has seen this as a threat and as, as the source for the economic difficulties that many people and many groups in the society were, were experiencing. Simona? I'm leaving the UK because of Brexit. In my resignation letter to the LSE is written down. Brexit has been a push factor. So, personally, the UK is poorer and will be poorer. Now, obviously, LSC has been the top of my career and, you know, here I have my main quarters, my main colleagues and friends, so I'm affiliated and I will keep going, but I couldn't live outside Europe. On the vote and respect for the vote, I'm a bit more critical than Ricardo because the vote was highly manipulated and you don't make people choose. You know the most Googled question the day after the referendum, 2.7 million people Googled what is the European Union in the UK, okay? So people weren't aware of what they were doing. In fact, nowadays, the referendum would go in a totally different direction, obviously, right? On the other hand, it is in the history of the mm, now d defunct empire of the British, of the UK, the skepticism of Europe has been there since the goal. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, it's a long, long story. But it's been a tragedy and it will continue to be. You know. I, I shouldn't intervene because I'm the moderator, but I'm just going to say one thing here. Um, yes, probably the referendum was uh, highly manipulated and uh, was highly influenced. And that might have affected the result, which was marginal in yeah. 2016. Having said that, when uh, people voted for Boris Johnson and the Conservatives in 2019, 
which by the time was already not Brexit in the single market or Brexit with the customs union, but it was the hardest type of Brexit. It was the UKIP, mm, the right. UK, UK independence program uh, vote in, uh, in 2015 that was adopted in that respect by the Conservatives. They knew what they were voting mm. and they actually decided we're going to vote for Boris Johnson. That has led the UK to what it is. And I think probably uh, your research, Ricardo, what he has said, this unbalanced impact. The UK has been the country in the European Union that has benefited more from European integration, from globalization, from the mobility of foreign direct investment. London, that was a declining city since the 1930s yeah. until the 1990s, yeah. became the main global financial hub in a period that started just in the 1990s until now. Mm. Well, if you concentrate all the benefits in one city and the surrounding area, the rest of the country doesn't benefit and you lose non-routine uh, uh, routine jobs like uh, you have demonstrated very clearly, mm. the rest of the country is going to say, if I'm sinking, I don't want to sink alone. Yeah. And now you have a country like the UK that despite it's a country I work in, I live in, I love massively, but it's a country that is the one that hasn't yet recovered among the big, biggest economies, the only one since the pandemic. Second, the country that has got, according to the IMF, the worst growth prospects in the future. the future. And London is no longer the main financial hub in the world. It has been taken over by New York and is losing ground, albeit slowly. It's a big city and is dynamic and is yeah. resilient but to places like Paris, to places like Amsterdam, and to places like Dublin, fundamentally. Exactly. Okay, next question from the audience. Oh, there's... Hello, uh, my name is Alexei, and uh, I would like to ask about the artificial intelligence, because Ricardo mentioned it briefly and Simono uh, also did. And what uh, could we expect from it and how uh, can it influence the field? Well, it's a very broad question, but Thank it's you, really Alex. interesting because there is so many debates going on now. Artificial intelligence, uh, Ricardo? Will you? Well, I, I think here there is an important uh, uh, point to be made that, that links what we were, we were discussing before about the unevenness of these processes. And I think, uh, like COVID-19, in a certain sense, with us like working from home and communicating via, via Zoom, has like made this very apparent. And uh, we were mentioning before with, with Frank, it, it, something that you can do from home can be done, like ideally, you know, if you don't, if it, uh, we don't need to have like a physical interaction, we are not exchanging like what we call like highly valuable knowledge. Uh, if I can do something like alone in my in my in my home office this same job, this same task uh, can be pursued somewhere like in an emerging economy, can be done uh, in India, can be done uh, in, in other countries, or can be completely automated. And if you look uh, at, the, at the, 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 the share and, and the intensity at which different tasks could be worked from home, and you compare it with the recent data on the risk of the same task being pursued by an artificial intelligence, the correlation is striking. So I think with the pandemic and with the work, with the new geography of work from home, we have really seen just a small anticipation of what the artificial intelligence could do to the geography of jobs in advanced economies. So the issue really becomes, okay, how do we deal with that? How do we manage this? How do we regulate artificial intelligence? But also how do we build uh, an understanding of the distribution of the opportunities as well as the benefits offered by, by artificial intelligence. And from the work that we have done on work from home, these benefits, as a proxy from what might happen, are the, the benefits are hugely unevenly distributed across sectors, but also across typologies of firms with small and medium enterprises really struggling with these new technologies, as well as geographies. When you look at the real data, for example, on the adoption of work from home, you see that this is mostly like a highly advanced urban phenomena. When it comes to less developed regions, when it comes to uh, uh, less developed places in Europe, uh, you do see that opportunities are really not there, are much more like difficult to uh, uh, capture. 
So really artificial intelligence, uh, I, I think, goes hand in hand with uh, uh, new ways of working and uh, work from home and the digitalization of the economy opens a completely new uh, agenda that links uh, with what, what we mentioned before, because when a task like, can be delocalized, then also the service sector that employs a large share of, of total uh, employment in, in advanced economies then can be delocalized, can become part of, of, of global or more global value chains. So it's, it, it's a completely new chapter that really requires urgent, an urgent understanding and an urgent adoption of uh, 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 effective uh, policies in order to make sure that opportunities and challenges are correctly balanced uh, before it's really too late. Nasser? Well, I mean, what we see is, is a lot of firms, and these are uh, mid-sized firms, investing a lot in digitalizing their processes in order to take advantage of this. Yeah. So, so the first step is, is actually having the data and having your processes digitized. And the second step is putting in the value-added services. So Internet of Things, artificial intelligence. And there is a huge process going on there on firms trying to maintain their capabilities. And they're obviously aware that they have to invest in these areas. It's obvious that, I mean, the outcome of these, it, it's hard for some of them to compete with obviously the larger corporates. But it's also true that the technology firms are trying to deliver specific products for these specific, vert sec so both vertical for industry specific industries and both horizontal three for specific sizes of firms. And there's a whole race of investment in these areas and we see lots of transactions in these areas trying to offer these products and that there is strong competition in providing these services to firms. Now, what the outcome of that will it be in five, ten years' time, it probably will depend on some sectors. I mean, some sectors are clearly, they will have <coughs> um, significantly greater levels of automation, significantly um, better resilience in the logistics sectors due to that uh, digitization of all the processes. So some, they will be able to compete. Others, look, it, it obviously will have an impact on, on, on employment and the type of employment presumably. Yeah. Anyone else? Just to, to, to add, uh, I mean, it, it's always been like this. There are technological shifts or, or paradigm, and AI is for sure a general purpose technology. Well, if you go back in the history of technological progress, there are wonderful historians that look since the, 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 the origin of the human being, you see that there are two trends in a new wave of technologies like AI, right, is on the one hand, the concentration of the wealth that this brings in a few hands, on the other hand, the diffusion. So it's a balance between these two forces. If you manage to diffuse, then obviously AI will be a massive, right, a massive positive thing for small firms, for firms or entrepreneurs in remote places, people that are not connected and instead, ICT has shown that, right, already, that you, 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 you were mentioning uh, example, we were mentioning example. On the other hand, however, there are drawbacks precisely for this concentration of the profits in, uh, in a few hands, and I'm going beyond beyond the big tech thing. On the other hand, there are more and more societal, environmental, beyond economic implication, right? And uh, just thinking about work from home, we have seen at the same time, which is obviously very important, it is an innovation in the sense, but behavioral problems are also rising, right? I mean, depression, and isolation, incapability of young generation to communicate among each other. So it brings also a whole range of problems that we have to consider, we have to, to cope with. So it's keeping everything on balance. It's, it's very difficult. Other questions from the audience? Now, if not, I have, uh, to wrap it up, a question that I've been itching to ask from the very beginning. I started my presentation uh, three, four hours ago highlighting that this has been a topic that has been on the news in Spain. That we have one of our main companies, Ferrovial, deciding to move 
either for tax reasons or for better access to markets or for uh, better access to funding to another part of the world, in this case to the Netherlands. Um, what would be your recommendation to the Spanish government or to any government about what to do in order to make sure that capital, which has become highly mobile in recent years, as we have seen, stays, but also that capital can come in to the country and also move to other parts of the world in order to create much greater wealth. Frank, would you like to start? <laughs> um, well, every time a company moves to the Netherlands, I have to wonder, <laughs> did the tax code help? Um, and that's, of course, uh, uh, something that within Europe is, uh, is detrimental. So you, you don't want uh, location choices to be distorted by, by, um, by differential tax treatment too much. But, uh, just full disclosure, you're Dutch. Yes, I'm Dutch. <laughs> to, uh, to what extent does that make that really make a difference? Would a firm go to the Netherlands just because it has a lower, a slightly lower taxation? Uh, I mean, there's... Definitely uh, examples of it. it. It depends on how much the Netherlands actually gets beyond, like the the, the slight tax increase in its uh, on its uh, low um, on it, uh, on the tax deals that they have. Because if you really want the benefits from a company, the company needs to come, um, and then it's uh, it's competing more on the capabilities. Um, and I think in um, in a sense, in terms of value chains. Um, Cities start to compete more and more on functions in value chains. So it's not that I'm uh, I'm a car city or I'm a, an iPhone city, or but it's more I'm a I'm a assembly city. I'm an R and D city. Um, so so I guess in that sense, it it helps to figure out what is your core competence and how can you try to maximize your your reach into these. How can you become a node? in many value chains. And um, uh, the, this, this is a very city-specific question. So it's, it's, it's a very local question what you actually need to do to make, a, uh, uh, to make your place more attractive for uh, certain types of uh, activities. So I think that uh, yeah, th this is something that everybody says. Um, one size fits all is very is, is not going to work in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, on the one hand, don't 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 try to gain too much in the tax game because that's that's just driving us all to a very bi bad place. Uh, and then focus on the strengths that you have and try to uh, uh, to form these partnerships across cities. Mm -hmm. Simona, well, I, I would say, I mean, th that capital comes and goes. And the most important thing is that you have both, right? As far as you keep receiving and sending and receiving and sending, we have evidence also looking at regions with Ricardo FDI. The most successful places are those that send and receive mm -hmm. in both directions. It's never, it's never a tragedy. If so. I would say that maybe paying attention on why others go, although in this specific case, the Netherlands have a relative <laughs> <laughs> advantage in tax levels. So, I mean, that, that is something that should maybe be a bit more concerted at the EU level. So, going back to the previous point. Nasir? Um, well, I think a relevant part would be that there is uh, regulatory stability. I think that that's what I would point to most. In, in the case of renewables, again, it was very harmful in 2013 when there was a retroactive regulatory change to the feed-in tariffs that renewable assets were receiving. A lot of foreign investors lost a lot of money, and there's plenty of arbitration still against the state of Spain due to that reason. And when you called investors in the following years with an asset in Spain, they, they just wouldn't, wouldn't listen to you. It's fair to say that that was generated by a very specific uh, energy deficit and once that had sort of been sorted and flowed through the system and the economic sense of any further changes decreased, that investors did come back and there's a lot 
or there's huge amounts of investments. So I think stable regulatory environments would, I think, is, is, is the key, is a level playing field and understanding what you can think about will be the future. Understanding that there will be some changes. I think, for example, we talked to a lot of people on the, um, some of the regular changes in the energy sector, for example, windfall profits that uh, renewable um, generators were receiving. And overall, many people understood it. They were receiving still, even with the windfall tax, they were still receiving very high prices, mostly, uh, well above what many of them had originally uh, forecast when they made their original investments. So it was reasonably understandable and it was a temporary measure. Now, if it's a complete wholesale change, well, that obviously has a very relevant impact. And Ricardo? Well, Andres, I, I, I agree with Simona that when looking at like large companies and investment and divestment, which should really like see uh, uh, FDI and uh, in their different forms as, as flows. So some are coming, some are going. I think uh, if we look at the recent data in terms of the internationalization of the economy, really like one of the big stylized fact that is still relatively hidden is the fact that a lot of activity now is not in new greenfield investment. So there is a lot, but we, we have a sort of plateau that started in 2008. So we nev the, the world economy reached a sort of plateau in terms of new greenfield investments around to following the, 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 the financial crisis. And I think it's mostly about the expansion and re the rebalancing of existing foreign activities. So a lot is happening, in particular because of the reassessment of risk and the reorganization of global supply chains. Rather than making a new investment, I might say, OK, I need to reshift part of my production capacity near shore in some sense, uh, have more in Europe or have in safer places or diversify more my supply chain. And when we look at data more than on greenfield investment, on the expansion of existing domestic and foreign activities, that where we see a lot of, uh, of, of action. So I think uh, like a short like take home message would be don't play the incentive game uh, uh, that was mentioned by Frank, for example, when discussing about Amazon at quarter two, but focus on nurturing the type of activities that you have at the moment on the ground. And sometimes this might be like a less flashy, a less visible type of activity because it's really, like I mentioned in my presentation, a little bit doing the job of a plumber, really building the small like uh, pipelines around the firm. But this becomes crucially important in having a well-functioning ecosystem that can allow the expansion of existing investment. So you don't see this like necessarily in your like new Greenfield FDI uh, data, but you do see in terms of uh, the expansion of foreign activities uh, in the local economy and you can see in terms of uh, uh, employment benefits as well as implications for the local supply chain. So for small and medium enterprises acting as suppliers for these companies. So I, I, I think this is like maybe a less fleshy type of policy message, but it goes hand in hand with what Simona was mentioning. It don't put too much, it, it works well for the headlines, but not to focus too, too much on this type of uh, uh, investment games and, and focus instead on the real assets and what can happen gradually, uh, sometimes painfully on the ground. Focus on the fundamentals, not on the peripherals. So all good things have to come to an end. I would like to thank Frank and Simona, Nasir and Ricardo for a wonderful day of presentations and debate at the end. Uh, uh, but before I finish, and I'm going to switch now to uh, Spanish, quería agradecer a la Fundación Cañada Blanche, a CaixaBank, a Caixa Forum por haber tenido uh, pues la gentileza de no solo de mantenernos y de apoyarnos desde hace tantísimo tiempo, sino de traernos a Valencia todos los años para tener este foro. Pero las actividades no se acaban en Valencia. Nosotros en Londres, en el centro Cañada Blanche, tenemos actividades todos los trimestres. Este trimestre, por ejemplo, como actividades fundamentales, hemos tenido al gobernador del Banco de España, Pablo Hernández de Cos, y después a la vicepresidenta del Gobierno, Nadia Calviño, en diálogo con nuestra rectora y la nueva rectora de la Universidad de Columbia en Nueva York, Minus Shafik. Aparte de muchas actividades menos, eh, digamos, de menos relieve, pero muy importantes porque son actividades puramente científicas y académicas. 
Les aconsejo a todos, si están interesados, no es necesario venir a Londres. Nuestras actividades se hacen todas eh, en línea, se hacen en presencia, pero también en línea, en nuestro canal de YouTube. Entonces, si están interesados, les agradezco que miren por el Centro Cañada Blanche en la LSI, en inglés, Cañada Blanche Center at LSI, tanto en Twitter como en YouTube, como en LinkedIn, que nos sigan y si nos pueden seguir en línea, perfecto, si nos pueden seguir en actividades presenciales en Londres, son todos bienvenidos a venir a la London School of Economics porque allí tendrán su casa, como creo que la tenemos nosotros aquí siempre en Valencia. Muchísimas gracias por, su eh, eh, por asistir, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros lo que son ya más de cuatro horas y espero poderles ver, si no en Londres, en el próximo foro que seguramente lo tendremos también en Valencia el año que viene en torno al mes de abril o el mes de mayo. Gracias.